Welcome to the entrepreneurial finance portion of your module on entrepreneurial leadership and strategies in a global environment. You should have received written instructions on Blackboard or by email instructing you how to download and open the mind map on terms and concepts used in entrepreneurial finance, which is the first mind map we'll use. We'll cover that mind map in four, five, or six short audio lectures of about 10 minutes each. And then we'll go on to another mind map on actually funding a business and that will integrate all of the terms and concepts we've been talking about. So let me first deal with company objectives in obtaining financing. It's at one o'clock on your mind map. Of course, any business that's going to start, the founders have to determine what their financing objectives are or the strategy of obtaining financing. Of course, they have to fund the startup expenses, the losses, and the capital the investment that will be required. And ordinarily, the expenses will often far exceed the projections and the revenues will delay, or be delayed rather, the uh, from the revenue projections and losses will occur and there must be enough funding to cover those losses. So once the losses have been incurred, the company is getting ready to turn into a break-even operation now, it's time to determine how to fund growth. Well, will, be, will that growth be rapid growth? Will it be growth by acquisition? Or will it be slower growth? Well, rapid growth requires much more capital than slower growth. Usually slower growth would be equated to a lifestyle business uh, because investors are not usually interested in funding businesses that will grow slowly. Growth by acquisition is another subject and of course it takes capital for growth by acquisition. And the number one aspect that the founders have in obtaining financing is to retain control. You would think it's valuation, which is a close second, but it is to retain control. It's understandable. Um, for purposes of our lectures here, I want you to equate founders also to a parent corporation that's going to start an operation through a subsidiary. The concepts are still the same. Well, Founders want to minimize investor controls, yet investors want to maximize their controls, although sophisticated investors are ordinarily satisfied with having veto powers rather than to have the affirmative ability to dictate to the corporation what it must do. And if there's borrowing involved, the founders want to minimize the default conditions that would create a default in any loans or borrowings the company has. So the founders want to maximize their percentage ownership. Well, that equates to valuation, which we'll cover in a few minutes. The investors and lenders' views are often not aligned with the founders' views. And this often is very difficult to detect when investors are approaching the company, the company's approaching investors, and so forth. But most investors have a short-term viewpoint, three to five years. Most founders have a much longer viewpoint. The business strategy employed by founders often differ with the business strategy that investors believe the founders should use. And the financing strategy going forward after the initial investment may be very different in the eyes of the founders versus the eyes of the investors. It's important to find this out to see if those strategies and views can be aligned with the founders' views. So let's go to the next most important point for founders, valuation of the company for financing purposes. So how does a company go about determining its value to determine if it's getting a fair deal from investors if it's a startup or an early stage business? It's a very difficult question to answer and ordinary valuation techniques, frankly, do not apply because there are there is no history, if you will, of earnings or even revenues. And so 
rules of thumb must be used, and they do exist for every type of business that an, a founders might engage in or a company might want to start up. And those rules of thumb usually are um, fairly conservative, but they do exist, and they're known by investors. And it's important for the founders to learn what those rules of thumb are, because trying to have a valuation that far exceeds the valuation that these rules of thumb might put on the company will usually result in investors walking away. At any rate, uh, the valuation can be determined in a simple way when investors acquire X percent of the company for Y dollars. Now, let's assume that a group of investors invests a million dollars into a company by buying convertible preferred stock. It's an early stage company. And the investors negotiated with the founders to own one third of the company after their investment. Well, what valuation did they place on the company? They placed a $3 million valuation. $1 million is one third or 33% of $3 million. Well, the terms that we use are pre-money and after money valuation. The pre-money valuation was $2 million. So that's the value that the investors said the founders own, unless there are family and friends in there too, $2 million, and the investors own $1 million. But when the investment by the investors is in the form of a convertible preferred stock or convertible notes, which come right off the top if the company is sold or the company liquidates, until the company's real valuation passes through the $1 million mark, there's no value for the underlying stock for the founders or family and friends. So it's somewhat misleading to equate a value of just by using the percentages when there are preferred securities involved. And most investors are smart enough not to just purchase common stock in early stage companies. And we'll get to the reasons for that at a later lecture. So that concludes our first audio. And um, we'll go on to the second audio. I urge you to look over the mind map to see where we're headed and see the topics we'll be covering in audio two. Thank you.